Ladies and gentlemen, I am already being entertained. You are not partaking in this yet, but I've got Damien off camera, and he is... The man was born to choreograph. I think that's the, the lesson here. He's got well, a... That's good music. That? Is that a salt and pepper shaker? Uh, this is a, a this is a dancing Japanese robot here. Okay, I'm, I'm bringing Damien on right away because you guys got to see this. <laughs> this you know, this, this hap you were playing music that uh, this happened to be sitting behind me on my on my. This is you know I don't know. This is where the, the toys and some of the bottles of booze I guess are. And then I don't know. It looked like it wanted to dance. I also have a uh, I have a I have a donkey that jumps. Hold on, watch this one. <laughs> oh, I didn't. I, I didn't even realize it was set up in the in the in the play area. That's like the uh, the hydraulic car, the lowriders, oomps, right? Oomps, but the donkey oomps, form. Yeah, yeah. I think it was probably actually meant to be a political. I think it was probably a Democrat donkey, but I'm not sure. Uh huh. I could see it. <laughs> there's a lot. Of, I mean, we, there's a lot of toys around here. I, I, I figured we were probably going to talk about music and stuff, but but I mean, I got. We'll do toys. Yeah, we'll do toys. This I, top, I, I can spin this top here. We'll just, I'll start this top now and we'll just see how long into the interview it takes before it Oh, stops. sweet. Okay. Well, here's what we'll do. We'll spin really the top powerful. and I'll, uh, I'll give people a little information. Sounds good. While it spins. Okay, cool. So, guys, uh, welcome. Uh, we're kind of off and running here, but I did want to tell you, uh, if you're new to joining us, uh, we have a thing that we're doing. Every night, we play music from you guys that you send to us via uh, Twitter or via Facebook, we have a hashtag called MMM Prop Songs, and if you tweet your music, a link to SoundCloud with that hashtag, I check that every day, I pick something every day, and I put, I put it up. So send us your music, because that's great. <laughs> it's great, Damien. Okay, this is actually, it helps me wrap up faster. <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, top in the house. That's gonna uh, be going for like 15 minutes, so you're cool. Oh wow, okay. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to tell you guys is if you have a question for Damien, uh, go ahead and put the word question in all caps in the chat and it'll help me kind of hone in on it. But anyway. I didn't realize it kind of makes a lot of noise though, doesn't it? Can you hear it going I do, yes, yes. You want me to stop it? Is it screwing up our whole scene? I, I suppose. It, All right. it does take away some element of our uh, of the no, excitement, no. but we'll add that back. We'll we'll amp it back not, in. It's not even it's not even begun to slow down this thing. Ah, it's a, it's a really powerful top. Anyway, sorry, it's, sorry. It's I'm almost sad. We've, you're we've really cut. professional about this, and I'm being really unprofessional. No, this I, it, that's quite fine. I can be. Uh, uh, I think uh, what I always I've done uh, half a month of these, right? So I'm I'm two weeks into my tenure as a uh, webcaster, and uh, mm -hmm. my favorite ones are the ones that are just casual hangouts. So, you know, I can cool. just hang out and then you know forget about the chat room. No, I'm kidding. So Wait, listen, forget man. you chatsters. That's right. Um, thanks for joining us. Let me just start thanks. off by saying thank you so much. And um, I, you know, we are uh, thrilled beyond words to, to have you, not just to have you uh, in our chat room tonight, but to have you essentially in our user community uh, as as a broader world. I am a big I am a big big fan of of Propellerhead. There's a there um, reason reason totally changed the way we uh, we can work because I can I can actually write things on airplanes now. It's great. Uh huh. Right. I I I want to talk to you about all of this, but I think that it would be remiss of me if we didn't um, sort of, I, you know, I have this in interesting opportunity to talk to all you guys and sort of uh, pick your brains about how you got where you got and, and, and why you do things the way you do. And I think the, the biggest thing about you guys, obviously, is your video success, your viral video success. And, and you know, you wrote an op-ed uh, in in, a, in the newspaper, and you began the piece. The first sentence was, "My band makes videos," or something something to that effect. I think I'm paraphrasing a little bit, but it's a very simple declarative statement. And I thought, uh, well, that sums it up, right? Yeah, well, we're pretty well known for our videos. It's true. I, um, uh, it's you know, I, I spend a lot of time doing interviews, and it's so it, it's it's funny how often I have to sort of like. Um, you know, people ask if I'm worried that the videos are somehow overtaking the music or something, as if as if people who wake up in the morning making stuff w worry about the categories for it. You know, um, mm. like 
I, I love I love writing songs. I love recording songs. I love making albums. I love putting t- putting on rock shows. I love playing with my rock band, and I love making videos. You know, there's no. Um, and to you, it's, it's all just creative outlet. Yeah, and there's no. I mean, there's sort of the the idea that um, th- that I would be doing this, or any of us would be doing this, so that we could check off the boxes that our parents or our grandparents' generations had 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 set out for us is ridiculous. You know, um, there. I feel you know we we sort of all live in this world. I mean, here we are, we like in digital space. This is we are making ones and zeros right now, and everyone <laughs> I know in the creative world basically does that. You know, like whether it, architects make ones and zeros. They do eventually become buildings if they're, you know, if they're lucky enough and, and successful enough. Um, and, you know, uh, journalists make ones and zeros and, and musicians and, and dancers and every, I mean, it's like a, a, everything lives in digital space. We all live in digital space. And the idea that we should respect these boundaries that existed because of formats in a, of a different time, you know, like sound recordings were one thing and films were one thing and, you know, everything sort of had its box. Like, I, I'm not, <laughs> Ooh, excuse me. I'm not all. I'm not that. I'm not that interested in in uh, in in reifying those boxes. Like I am a musician, and so what I make is this one type of thing. You know. Mm. Um, I mean, I, I for me, it, I tend to be actually fairly traditional in the way I work um, it, musically. Like, I, you know, I sit down with a guitar or a piano or a computer, and I and I, I play around with sounds and with with chord progressions and with beats and with lyrics and, and sort of come up with things that, in that little audio bubble of my own brain, are 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 meaningful and evocative and emotional. And and I think that's actually a pretty traditional way to work. But from there, it goes anywhere. You know, um, mm. if if if. Uh, if if YouTube and 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 short filmmaking is is um, not only another creative out, outlet but an, a, but a great way to distribute music, then then I don't have to deal with major labels and I don't have to deal with with you know chart positions and radio play and all this crap. You know. Hmm. The you know I, I was speaking with a, a friend of mine today. Uh, about this, and he said something that that I sort of resonated with me in in relation to the video stuff, and it was that the I think the, the thing that you guys captured um, when when your early videos really resonated with people and sort of got their now, you know now it's, it's it's cliche to call it viral success and all that but um, the the thing that sort of resonated with people was the same thing that resonated with the first viewers of MTV it was the spectacle of seeing. Uh, it's almost like how could it be that thirty years into the music video we all got surprised by the music video again? But we did, you know. Well, because the music video had um, had long since become uh, in a, a, a purely an advertising medium. You know, I mean, it, there's there. It's been a long, you know, prior to, and I don't want to like toot my own horn here, but prior to a, a, our sort of moment in two thousand five or six or whatever it was, mm-hmm. um, it had been a very long time since musicians made their own made videos. You know, what you, you have a, the head of a record label or their video commissioner. Paying for an advertisement to be made to sell. See, we're back, guys. Hi, universe. I'm just gonna wait and get the okay. The okay go. Can I? Can I be that pun? Punful. You're, yeah, you're, you. You. You would not be the first, but I'm. I'm ready. No. Go there. No, I'm sorry. It's all right. I'm. I got a. I got a. I got a. Um. A whole. I got magnetic balls to play with here. Well, you're. So you're all set. Yeah, no, you, All right, so we, we know when it goes down again. What I'm doing. Has, clearly, your toy box is sitting right next to you. Yeah, there's this is this is the good stuff. This is the this is the dining room table toys. Um, Do you have the but, uh, pin face that they used to sell at like? No, Spencer's? those things kind of freak me out. But I but you want a little tour? I'll show you what I do have. I have uh, well, that's there's the, the Tim gave me this puzzle that is I just a, finished. It's a puzzle. Yeah, it's a puzzle. It looks like a maze. It's a, it is a maze. It's a, it's a puzzle from the '70s. It's really beautiful. I probably can't really see so well from here, but uh, you know, I'll tell you, show you some other personal faves. I, um, over at the piano here, we got the Taj Mahal made out of Legos. Nice. Did you build it yourself? I did. Yeah. I mean, it, you can. You it, there's a there's a, a a kit. I mean, it's not. I didn't make it up. Uh, so is this uh, guitar? That's always fun. Right. I don't know. Well, I think the the house tour actually could get pretty old pretty quick. Well, we'll get back to work. It's nice though. It's like yes. a, a uStream lo-fi version of uh, cribs. Cribs. Yeah. yeah. Cribs. We could go to the garden. Actually, the garden.
Oh, now I lost you. Should... Oh, there you are. You're back. Am I back yet? Am I back? Yeah. <laughs> the Million Ways video is actually shot from right here. This is, the camera was right here. No kidding. Yeah. I mean, I didn't have... The garden has changed a little bit since then. I knocked out some concrete and put in some plants. Well, see, look, you see, you thought the, the house tour was getting boring, and now we got a little... Uh... It's a segue back into video land. Yeah, right, right. <laughs> right. So, I don't know where we were, but, you know, well, I'll just... We'll you, just... you were asking about videos, and we were talking about how in the, in the 80s and 90s, the, um, the music industry was... I mean, you know, the vi right, videos have been important right. for a very long time, and it's funny that now, it, like, it's seen as a shtick for, for bands to make their own videos, like it, it, it was. It was totally cool to have your success completely based on the fact that that you know a, a, a Hollywood director had had been paid you know, two million dollars to make a giant video for you, and that was a success. But if you make your own videos, like that's a shtick. You know, it's a it's mm. a it's a it's a it's a funny moment in 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 vi in video and and sort of like art making universes because everything is kind of collapsing. You know, you've got. Um, there's no, we don't need the, the, the categories that the old system used um, were based on the uh, sort of like the uh, distribution and um, uh, it, it, logistical needs of those categories. You know, I mean, like you, you're a musician and you want people to hear your music and there's these recording technologies. So uh, like up comes a giant system of distribution for for making seven inch records and eventually 12 inch records and and distributing them up, out into the world and sharing your music with people and this means a lot of brick and mortar stores and all these you know pressing plants and and uh, you know sh shipping channels and trucks and you know all all sorts of stuff that we just don't really need anymore and suddenly music has gotten back to a place that's much more Experiential, you know. Um, when someone says to you, like, "Have you heard that new CeeLo song?" You don't picture a CD, you know. You don't. <laughs> I don't. I don't know what the. I mean, no offense, CeeLo, who's like one of my favorite people in the world. I don't know what the cover to his album looks like, you know. But I sure know that song. And and I, as it turns out, I know the recording of that song. But um, but let's see, like, if you know that that Penny and the Quarters song, I only know the demo to that, you know, or the uh, the. Uh, I'm trying to think what there's like a there's a song by the Morning Benders where, um, that they did a YouTube recording of that I think is actually way more beautiful than the album version and so I like I have actually come to know that song as the song rather than the than the 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 product that is the recording of that song. Yeah. Then let me ask you, Damien, why and and directly asking about your band and people in general, why do albums? Why design cover art? Uh, well, I think there's two pretty good answers to that. One, um, from a productive perspective, I, I, I don't like having to pick one thing and and um, know from the moment I have planned it to the moment it is finished that that is the one thing I want to be doing. Um, uh, let me back up. I mean, that's a little too vague. I, for our last album, we wrote 106 demos. Um, wow. There and and. I couldn't have told you when we had hit, you know, 22 that that was enough to go into the studio with, um, or I couldn't have told you when we had all 106 sitting out in front of us which ones would be the best recordings. And certainly, once you know, so we started on I think 20 or 25 of them and got that down to 18 that we were really going to like try to get on the album. And by the time the record came out, I think we were down to you know 12 or 14. Um, and I certainly couldn't have picked, I mean, even by the time the album was recorded, I couldn't have told you, like, this, this is the, the most commercial song, or this is the most accessible song, or this is the song that matches this moment in history, or this sort of feeling this summer, or whatever it is, you know? Um, so the, the last thing I would want to do as an artist is to, is to have to plan out in advance of everything I make exactly what it is I'm going to make. You know, I mean, what what you want to do is have have the opportunity for, um, you know, for for lucky mistakes and ha and have things that you couldn't have planned happen and strike you and go, wow, that's amazing. So, um, so working on an album gives you that opportunity because you can you can sort of you can st stretch into weirder and more wonderful corners because not every song has to be a single or not every song has to sort of sustain your career. That's one reason from the productive perspective, and then from from the industrial perspective in a much more boring way, um, the world just hasn't really figured out. 
a, a sustainable system for, for um, distributing music profitably that it, that it, in smaller chunks, you know? If, I, if my band, you know, like, say we were to put out 12 songs every two years, that means on average we're putting out a song every two months. Um, if we needed to sort of put out a song every two months and, and, and get reviews on Rolling Stone and get placement on iTunes and blah, 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 you know, all the things that sort of carry music out into the world in a commercial way yeah. are designed still around the album cycle. So even though no one's selling records and they're not really making any money, for the, for the, for the, sort of music consuming community to know, oh, right now we're having the White Stripes moment and now we're having the Shins moment and now we're having, you know, Tron Legacy moment and now we're having, like, whatever it is, these sort of, like, these media snowballs have to exist around some kind of package and and it's hard for that to be a single because we'd be doing them every month, you know. Sure, sure. Sure. Let me ask you a a question that's come in via the chat uh, from Anuso, uh, he wants to know. Uh, I lost do you, for a second. What's that? What's that? Uh, it just it stuttered for a second, but what? Oh, about? okay. His question is: Do you think that the melodic hook in a track is more important than the sonic hook, so to speak? What weighs most, the melody or the instrument that plays it, and how it's produced? Uh, that is that is such a, a reason person's question, isn't it? <laughs> like, um, I think that that's kind of like being, uh, uh, that's like comparing apples and dignity. You know what I mean? It's not like they're just like, it's not just apples and oranges. They're totally different universes. I, um, I, I think that it's, it's pretty hard to have a, a great song based on sounds alone. I've never heard a, a song where where the song was crap, but the production was great, and so I wanted to hear it over and over again. Um, okay. Uh, uh, terrible production can kill a good song, but nothing can make a bad song good. No, no amount of production can make it good. So, um, hmm. so, so this this uh, or it, that is. I'm sorry. To my taste, I, I, I'm, there's plenty of, of of popular dance clubs that that seem to be proving me wrong. Um, <laughs> the, um, so you know, I, the the the, the uh, not trying to kick that the the can down the road, but I, like obviously, to each his own, and, and there's people who like everything. To, I, I think that um, that there's there's lots of things that can only exist in that production space. You know, I, uh, what's a really traditional example? Like like um, uh, "Sweet Emotion" by Aerosmith. Yeah, it's it's a great great song, but it has to sound exactly that way. Like, can you imagine a, a, a truly good cover of that song? Like, the song <laughs> is mostly about the uh, about like the sort of mix of that bass line. I mean, it's like it's a feeling song. It's a song about a, a, a feeling, and that has everything to do with sound and the sonic space. Um, whereas. Uh, uh, Hallelujah by by Leonard Cohen. Sure, um, sure. Every cover I've ever heard of that song is beautiful because it's a beautiful song. You know, mm. um, there's just it's different types of music. It's the difference between, you know, what I mean, like think about language as 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 uh, uh, like the programming language, like the syntax of 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 C plus plus versus the poetry of of you know William Carlos Williams. Like they're they're all the same words at some level, but they're performing. They're just like totally different functions. You know, that is exquisitely said. Thank you, sir. <laughs> Um, and so, for for you guys, then, when it comes to the writing process, uh, and the the when you're doing these 106 demos, can you sort of let us in on what that is? Is it is it you and Tim working out ideas together, or uh, generally, Tim and I work um, work sort of separately for the first um, between third and two thirds of a song. Um, usually one of us has to have some sort of uh, nugget of something there. And sometimes that's just a beat with a, a, a basic chord progression over it. Sometimes it's all, you know, it's the, it's a full song structure. Um, it, and usually we demo those uh, in, in, a, a, you know, in our home studios and then sort of bring them together and work on them from that point forward. Um, uh, it, that's, that's also on the last album. Andy wrote a bunch of songs in the sort of same context. Um, then when we go to the studio, uh, you know, 
or sorry, when, when, when we went to record our last album, and, and I guess the two records before that, actually getting into a professional studio with a producer and, and a sort of a, a, a working structure and schedule sort of put, sets us, we stop being the kind of um, tinkerers and engineers of it and become, and, and kind of watch it, like work it from a, a, a broader angle where we can be more, uh, where we can respond more creatively to the whole thing rather than build it piece by piece. I'm not sure if that's, too vague of an answer, but um, it, it is it is a very solo project for the first half-ish of a song, and then very collaborative for the second half-ish. I see. And, and do you end up almost sort of just pitching your songs and the, may the best song win? That- yeah, yeah, we tend to be pretty... Um, an, uh, an, we've worked together for so long. I mean, Tim and I have been in a band together now for almost 13 years and, and have been friends for 24 years, I think. Um, and have worked on so many projects together that the, that, that the fate of a particular song, um, or the sort of like our the amount of our ego that's tied into the success of any one idea is, is relatively low because there's always another song after that. And, and, and so it, it just feels like we all, we always want the things that collectively make us most proud. Um, and it's pretty easy for those things for us to figure out what those are. And there's, we have tons and tons of material we don't ever finish because there's lots of stuff where it's like, you know, say we've got, uh, we've got it narrowed down to 35 songs for this album, but but 18 of them are all sort of the same feeling, and so it's like, well, let, you know, like we we they, they may all, we may like them all, but let's just pick three or four of those to sort of represent that thing and not make the whole album have this one sound or feeling to it, you know. I see. Right. There was a question um, that came in. Uh, sorry, go ahead. From Becky Sue. Uh, Hi, Becky. Becky wants to know. <laughs> Now that you have she's your a, own, she's label. a super mega fan. It's nice to oh, see really? you again, Becky. Although I don't, oh, nice. I can't actually see you, but you can see me. Hi, okay. Becky. Um, <laughs> so Becky wants to know: Now that you have your own label, are you finding it easier, harder, more expensive to get into a studio to track a new album? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Easier and harder <laughs> and, and more expensive. Um, we are, um, you know, we do a lot of recording at home, um, but the, the problem, well, I really like working with producers because, uh, and especially with, with Dave Fridman, who we did our last record with, because it, it you get, uh, it's it's sort of like it's it's like a, a the the backboard in a basketball game you know um, sometimes you hit a, you you hit the jump shot at wet like all net anyways but it's nice to have something there to actually try bounce like something to push you back into the sweet spot when you need the pushing um, and and. Uh, I think with our next record, I mean, we, we would not, I, I will say that the, the structure that labels use, which is pay a big chunk of money to a producer up front, um, and then maybe some money later down the road, is not one that would be terribly easy for us to afford. I mean, we certainly don't have the kind of money to just be like, hey, Dave Fridman, super producer, why don't you spend three months with us in your, in your extremely beautiful studio? Um, but we love working with Dave, and Dave loves working with us, and I, I'm pretty sure we will figure out a way to, to pay the bills. It may not, it, it probably will not be the traditional way. We probably won't offer him, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars up front to go in there and and loll, lollygag around for a long time. But um, but we'll probably do a lot of recording on our own, and then and then go, and then go in for for a, a, at least a lot of weeks with him, um, because I think Dave's very smart about the way the world is changing also and he, he knows i mean there's still plenty of money in music it's just not in the same places right okay uh, that's really super question. Big, we no, haven't no. we you know we haven't figured out exactly how it's going to work yet right it will work. a uh, follow-up question came into the chat about uh, the the process by which you weed out songs for the album and stuff and they want to know if uh songs that don't make it onto a current album kind of stick around in the rotation and find their way onto f- future releases or b-sides we always think they will um although they rarely have um uh the song last leaf which is on our most recent album um i wrote i wrote i think before our first album came out actually um or shortly after it came out it was written uh it, it was written 
but like between the time that I, that those tracks were recorded and and we went on tour for that album, so I can't remember exactly when, but it, but that song's existed for ten years, um, or at least parts of that song. Have hmm. I, I wrote the second verse for this album, but um, uh, so things do. We do often go and mine the sort of the the collection of songs that are lying around for ideas, but. After we've been on tour for ever, as it seems like we always have when it's time to start writing again, um, going back into the studio and and working on something that feels old is like the last. It's just like the last thing you want to do. You know, it's like you just want to you want to go and do something new and something exciting and something that feels like fresh. And so, um, I it, I think if there's been any pattern to it, it's been like we we come home, we write for several months, and then once we've sort of gotten to the point where it's like we're, we're collecting stuff together is there anything else really great that we want to think about we go back through the old things and usually there's a couple things lying around we're like wow we really should you know let's try tidying this up or tidying that up um and uh, recently, Tim uh, has started releasing some of his uh, own songs under different names as well. Um, he's got a band called People and a band called Pyramids, um, mm -hmm. both just because there's, he has so much extra material lying around that he just wants to, you know, put out. So, it's, so um, I, I expect more of those things will will make it to light uh, in the future than have in the past, but we'll see. Gotcha. Okay. Uh, a few other questions. Uh, James Bernard, actually, who you know, are. I uh, love James Fetters. Bernard. <laughs> yeah, he, he wants to know your thoughts on uh, touring and how uh, important it is for you. Has it changed in over the course of your band's history? Uh, what role is that playing for you now? Well, my band's my band's relationship to touring. In fact, my band's relationship to everything for most of our career had been just like. Um, do everything, 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 everything. You know, like there's uh, uh, having an opportunity to make the things you love for a living is so rare and um, and and so sought after that that it just seems it's a stand to reason. Like you have you have to do every you have to take every possible opportunity because they're all such long shots, right? So mm. um, so. So touring was always kind of that way. It was like if there's an opportunity for a show, we better play it. You know, if there if there are people out there who we could be, um, we we could be playing our music for, we should be playing it for them. If there's if there is like pavement pounding we can do to make more fans, we should be doing it. Um, having said that, I think. Uh, Touring has never made much money for us. Um, we're at the point now where we don't lose money touring, um, but we occasionally we occasionally come back home with a little bit of money in our pockets. But it's not like it's it's not even close to enough to support the four people in the band plus our staff of people at our record label and and our management company and you know all, all the associated people you sort of need to have helping run parts of the business. So um, so touring is is mostly just a way to stay connected to our fans and stay um, and stay sort of present in in the universe um that's interesting and i think we do too much of it to tell you the truth i i would love to play for every person out there who wants who who, who wants us to play for them um but last year we played 180 shows and and hmm. and that wasn't even our most heavy touring year um and that means about 10 months on the road which means almost zero time for writing new music or having a, a personal life or feeding my dogs wow i mean it, it's interesting to hear you say that because I think that one of the sort of common, and maybe it's a myth, but common beliefs out there is that with the decline in physical sales, the importance of touring becomes the be-all and end-all, and it's almost sort of used as a justification by... You know the people that sort of trade in torrents and, and do a lot of the, yeah. the sort of pirate-based stuff. I'm going like, to go hey, to the show. Money from touring. Yeah, well, I don't know... Um, I, I, I don't know anyone who's making their money from touring, but then again, I'm not friends with Bono. You know, um, <laughs> the uh, the the people the the what seems to be the case in my experience is that the people least affected by the um, by album sale declines are also the people who are still making money touring. You know, like. Um, well, I suppose they're still affected, but but giant megastars who who made it in the pre um, in the pre digital era, um, they tend to to still play stadiums, and those people, you know, if you're it, to, basically touring is exponential. So when you're playing to a hundred people in a room, they're they're also paying five dollars a ticket, you know, um, and when you're playing to 
to 50,000 people in arena, they're also playing, paying $120 or $200 a ticket. So mm -hmm. it's, it doesn't, you, it, you, it, you go from it, from just losing tons and tons of money. You know, if you're, if you're, if you're in a band in a, in a van traipsing across America and getting paid $60 a night, you I mean, $60 is not enough money to get, get your, your van from one city to the next anymore. So like right. that's, you know, you're losing tons of money. Um, when you're, when you're playing to 500 or a thousand people a night, you're probably breaking even. And when you're playing to 5,000 people a night, you are making bank, you know, you're making tons of money. So it's true that larger acts can actually sustain themselves from touring. And there are some people around our size, um, who was I talking to recently? Uh, I mean, there's a bu there's a bunch of, of indie bands, sort of our size, who um, who who aggressively um, ag aggressively tour for profit and do you know they have very, they they keep their production budgets extremely low. You know, they don't they don't. I, I mean, we blow three hundred or five hundred dollars of confetti into the crowd every night. You know, you can't do that and make a lot of money. Um, and <laughs> they, but who was it? It was. Um, uh, who was it? But anyways, there's there's lots of bands sort of our size who can who can make money touring, but it's but it, you have to run an extremely tight ship, and it's a, it's a hard hard business. You know, it's it's certainly right. not making anyone rich. You know, interesting. And um, so I I wanted to talk to you a little bit about you know we've talked about the creativity and the writing process and the the demoing process, and and now you're talking about this a schedule where you're playing 180 shows. Which would be half a year if it literally was nonstop shows, but with travel and whatnot, you say it's about ten months a year. About yeah. How do you, be, you know, you're you're not using that two remaining months to then work on the album and record the next album. It's it's kind of got to fit in the little slots, right? Yeah, I mean, there's there's a couple things. One, we just sign up for things that make us get work done. I mean, we um, we recently did a, the theme song to the Morgan Spurlock film. Uh, Palm Wonderful presents the greatest movie ever sold, um, and and so that you know it, we told him we'd write him a theme song, and so it had to happen at some point, you know, and, and it wound up happening over Christmas break. That sort of sucked. I didn't really get to celebrate Christmas, but I did make a nice song, um, and so we'll just sort of shove it into the available spaces. Um, and also, we do a lot of work uh, wherever we are. You know, um, everyone uses our, our laptops as, as recording studios. We we, we mostly use um, we. Mo I mean, our, our basic setup tends to be uh, Reason and 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 Pro Tools. Um, we bring along M boxes with us pretty much wherever we go. And um, and uh, so there's a lot of demoing sort of done in hotel rooms and and on airplanes and um, and on days off places. Um, and uh, and then we just, you know, we 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 take a long time between albums. Unfortunately, like our our, our we've released three albums in ten years. I mean, I, you know, I think Cheap Trick released three albums in two and a half years. You know. <laughs> okay. Um, a question came in about uh, oh, from Becky Sue again. She wants to know: Did you make Love Me Long Time on your iPad or in the studio? Uh, I made Love Me Long Time. Uh, it, it was not on an iPad, but it was on. It was on. It was actually on. Yeah, it was on this laptop, the one that I'm now speaking to you from. Um, I was in New York, and uh, did I? Well, I'm trying to remember what I used for drums. I mean, it was all. Um, it, it's a. It was a song done for a, um, a, a an NPR spoof on on. April Fool's Day. They they um, did a they did a piece about the slow internet movement, which of course doesn't exist. But it was a <laughs> it's a joke about uh, sort of making fun of this like slow food movement and all that kind of stuff. People who 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 were doing dial up internet um, because they felt like it was a r more real connection to the universe. And so I made I made a really sort of like cheesy '90s '90s hip hop beat with using a um, using the dial tone. I mean, sorry, the dial up sound uh, and. Yeah, it was done. It was done in in Reason and in and in Pro Tools um, on this laptop. Gotcha. So what, well, let me ask you a little bit about Reason um, because I we have a bunch of Reason users out there, and they would love to to know what what you're up to with it. You know, you guys aren't exactly. Oh, by the way, everyone's enjoying the sound of these. Uh, oh, is, are they bothering you? I'm sorry. I'm just. No, I'm, no, 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 no. <laughs> but they, they're they've really, heard them in the. In the chat yeah, room. The little, that little clicking thing. If 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 you think it's weird, if it's it, that it's sound problems, it's not. It's that I have these sweet magnetic balls that are clicking together. I think somebody called them Bucky balls. Is that true? 
Bucky balls? Sure. Bucky. Bucky. Yeah, I don't know. Um, uh, yeah, apparently yeah. so. Uh, but so, <laughs> so I wanted to ask you about about your reason use and sort of, you know, you guys aren't putting out banging club tracks, at least not yes, OK Go. You are, right? No, just kidding. Uh, you I, do, I you do, have I, a side project, right? I, I have been doing making some dance music that is not yet released, but um, but what, when the time comes, we'll all know. Um, and we do do a lot, you know. Uh, what's the right way? Okay, I, you know, I recently did a project with uh, Amanda Palmer and Ben Folds um, and Neil Gaiman, and we went into a studio for eight hours and tried to record eight songs. And we actually wound up doing six songs in twelve hours, but. Um, Working with those guys reminded me how how uh, of ex it, it sort of it was holding up a mirror to the way that I write at, um, by seeing the different ways that they write. Um, Amanda and Ben are both amazing pianists, and I'm not really an amazing anythingist. Um, I, I I'm a, having played guitar every night for for you know 15 years. I can play guitar decently now, but I'm not like a, a shredding kind of guy. And um, and my piano playing is is. Pretty miserable. I mean, it's enough to sort of like be able to sound out a song, but I'm I'm I, I am not a great instrumentalist of any kind. So mostly, I think about music um, in terms of how it affects me, not not in terms of what I can make. Um, I, I I tend to. Uh, sort of imagine things and then try to make them and then in the process of making them stumble across other things I might like more. And um, so a lot of my songwriting comes from uh, it comes from building things ground up rather than sort of playing something and figuring out what all stick around it. So there's a lot of, I mean, I think probably two thirds or three quarters of the songs on our last album at some point existed as a, a, a drum beat very hastily put together in reason along with a chord progression sounded out on, on a, on a piano sound or an organ sound or something. And then, and then it sort of, Taken into Pro Tools, where I'll then play some live instruments on it, and then maybe strip them back out and redo it. I mean, like there's a lot of sort of going back and forth. Um, and what I love about Reason is that it's not uh, that that it it is um, it's a very intuitive user interface. It's uh, and and it feels like a full palette of sounds. I don't ever. I'm never like. Um, there, there's there's very little that that I can't I can't sort of uh, rough out in reason you know like I, I yeah. it, the one thing I can't really do are vocal melodies like when I, when I get a, a beat and a chord progression going and I want to try like well I'm sitting on an airplane and I've got this like great groove going and I'm going well what would it sound like if I sang da 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 ba, 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 over it the closest I can do is is get some sort of softish sound you know, like a, a, a mellotron choir or something doesn't actually sound like a human voice you know and a, and a a, a vocoder doesn't sound like a human voice, and so I often just use like a. You know what I use a lot actually is the um, the Celeste the the Celeste sound from the Abbey Road refill, uh -huh. um, because because it's just really soft and it, and and uh, and you get the sense of a, of a moving line without without having to sort of focus on the sound of that instrument. Um, I see. It and just keeps the idea there and. Yeah, it just sort of lets me know I was think sort of what I was thinking of singing, um, and so I don't know. You know, two thirds of the time that stuff all get, winds up being replayed or rethought or re sort of configured um, musically. But every once in a while, some of that stuff just winds up all the way there. And I think you know, I, on our record, there's there's you know there's several songs on our record where there where reason tracks that the song was built around are 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 still the the, the final song. You know, I see. Right. There's a question from Push Button. He wants to know if you have a particular template that you might, you know, when you fire up Reason, you hit Command New. Is it? Was just thinking about that yesterday about how I don't and ha and what and and how many hours of my life I've wasted because I haven't. I mean, I, <laughs> I, um, I, I for years I did have one based on a song that I, you know, like something I'd already put together, um, and now I, I literally actually do. Uh, I have to like make the 14 by two mixer. You know what I mean? Like, I, it's it's ridiculous. I, I should have a, a um, I should have a template. I for a long time, almost everything I used Reason for was was drum beats, and so I had a drum set that was built of um, of samples of Bunny Carlos's drums. But there's a there's a sample collection of um, I wonder if they ever even released this. Um, I I. Came across a copy of a uh, of of 
recordings of Bunny Carlos's drums that Steve Albini had made, and obviously Steve Albini makes the greatest drum sounds in the history of, of well, in the recent history of rock and roll. And so um, these great these great recordings of of, of Bunny Carlos, the, the drummer from Cheap Trick, and I just built a drum set in in Redrum uh, and. And for a long time, that was sort of like my go-to. I mean, for years, whenever I, when I opened Reason, that's what came up, and I would just start, you know, toying around with it. Interesting. Um, John Callahan wants John. to know if you have a favorite refill. Uh, I, my favorite, I mean, I, bang, bang for the time buck. I mean, not 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 price, but the amount of time it takes looking for the sound. Um, mm -hmm. uh, the um, Abbey Road one. The uh, there's you know the Abbey Road refill is great because it's only it's just it's like it whatever what is it, six sorry dog. metal man's here hold on um, the uh, there's six there are six or eight uh, dogs there are six or eight instruments in, um, you know main main instruments sampled in that Abbey Road refill and they're all just like just really basic studio instruments that I that I that I use a lot and they all sound great and you can get any like you know you can kind of get any any recorded sound out of them because they're recorded in so many ways um, and you know I find that in general um, for the for the for the things that I use Reason for, which is sort of like it's kind of like my digital orchestra, you know, it's like I, I can you imagine a violin a violin line, then you can program a violin line, and you can you imagine a, a trumpet line, you can program a trumpet line. You're like, I want this drum fill, I can basically program that drum fill. Um, for those things, what's important is is not going down the rabbit hole of of sounds and I, being a perfectionist i tend to love going down rabbit holes and i'm like oh but this sounds a little bit better and that sounds a little bit better so what i like is it, are, are tools and refills where i can get to a uh, to something that makes me feel creative quickly um, right. Right. I, 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 I example from my history i i when i went to college i um I learned how to use the Kurzweil K2000, and then later the uh -huh. Kurzweil K2500, and I could program that thing inside and out. And I, and and it, the user interface on that was miserable, but extremely, mm -hmm. extremely powerful. And you could sort of make anything with it. Um, and it's a great module. Hours, yeah, they're amazing. And and I and I spent I spent you know hours of my life, weeks of my life, learning how to use it. And I got really good at it. And for a long time, it sort of defined what I made. Um, and for years thereafter, I remember trying trying to always get tools that were like the the best tool, you know, the thing that was most powerful and that could do the most things. And realized uh, um, a little later that that what mattered to me was things that made me creative. Um, that when the user interface of something gets you excited and gets you thinking musically quickly, that's what you're going to get great music out of. It doesn't matter if you know, like having a better preamp that can make a better that, that can like you know that that can make people think they're listening to a fair child across your drums isn't going to matter if you don't have a good song so um so so i tend to look for things that that are um instead of being all inclusive and encyclopedic are are already sort of great selections you know um i find electromechanical the electromechanical refill is also really good that way because you know it's like you, you don't get stuck there listening to you know the the 85 different piano sounds you just you know like for me i need like a tack piano and a and a a, a grand piano and uh you know a whirly and a Rhodes. and and from from there like after that i don't need other keyboards you know like right. or i th then i move into synths and i need to be able to put like i need to be able to do a, a a saw wave and i need to be able to do a sine wave and i need then maybe 10 or 12 bass sounds that somebody else has already made that are kind of cool so I can play with. And when, when it gets down to like actually producing the track, then I'll get really anal about the things. But there's no point in spending that time before you've got a real song, you know? Yeah, right, sure. You sort of get tied into the minutia before the basic yeah, idea is even out. There's there's a um, when we were recording a record with Tor Johansson in Sweden, um, his his top engineers had a great term, which was fly fucking. Um, if you, <laughs> it's, I, I I believe it is worth fly fucking um, towards the end of a track. You know, when you've got something that you know is great, um, and 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 you really want to get it, it you want to let it speak the most it possibly can. Then by all means, listen to 
you know 150 slight variations of the of the of the synthesizer patch you want if, if you think that's going to make it better but if you're doing that right after you've come up with the with the, with the drum beat and you're trying to you're trying to get that timbre to actually make your sound your song good mm. you um you're just, you're just wasting your time by the, by the time you have found what you the the sound you want you will have lost perspective and you won't know what's good what what's a good or a bad song anymore anyways wow wow i think that's excellent advice and and you know one of the recurrent themes this month that keeps coming up is these sort of ways to break out of writer's block or ways to sort of not get bogged down in the 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 details and stay creative and i i've I'm not. I haven't been ceased to be amazed with the fact that everybody we've spoken to has different advice on that. But it all sort of has turned into this sum total of very great advice for the people that out there that are, you know, working on that timbre instead of the song. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I obviously I haven't I haven't been following following the advice you got from other people, but it's um, I you. It's, I can say this till the cows come home, but, but doing it is really hard and it's so much easier. And I would imagine, especially for, for your users, I, I mean, I tend to be so much more, or uh, let's see, what, filling in the blank canvas is, is or, or figuring out what to do on the blank canvas is so, so, so much harder and more challenging than, um, than painting in the details, that as soon as there are details to paint in, I'll try, like, my, my gut is to start trying to do them. And, I, and I'll spend hours and hours and hours um, on, stupidly on a on a on, like on these headphones on a plane, um, you know, like turning the distortion up and down and up and down on something to see if I can make it sound a little more slamming, um, just because it's it, that that little con, that little tiny puzzle is solvable, and you want to be like mm. your your heart always wants to be solving problems and being like getting farther, but it's not an important puzzle to solve. And in fact, you won't, you, you, by the time you solve it, you will have lost your, that, that inspiration. So it, 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 it's, it's so hard to keep yourself doing it, but, um, but keeping yourself focused on the forest and not the trees is the, is the only thing to songwriting. And, and I think, um, wait, there's a, oh yeah, rules. Like uh, giving yourself, um, uh, like trying, tr trying to, do basically writing etudes, you know, like write a one chord song and don't let yourself not write a one chord song, you know, write a song in a tempo that you are uncomfortable with. Like my, the tempo I always hear songs at is somewhere between 80 and 105, I mean, sorry, 90 and 105. Like I grew up in, you know, I was in high school in the nineties. All the hip hop I listened to is like, was, you know, like Tribe Called Quest beats, you know? And so everything to me has that, like exactly that beat and writing something at, at 135 is, it just doesn't, like it doesn't come natural to me mm -hmm. and um and and just like give yourself you know, and and then give yourself five hours to to do it and fail at it you know or give yourself a day and don't worry about what comes out at the end of it because if you do that five times one of those days if you do that ten times maybe one of those days something amazing will come out that you didn't know was in you um and i i uh, it's taken me a long time to learn what the way that I that that I think the best things come out of me, um, which is not to plan them in advance, but to but but to uh, but to find the moments, the, the magical moments in um, in something you don't entirely understand. You know, if I sit down to say I'm going to write. A, a stadium rock anthem. What I'll get out the other side is a stadium rock anthem, but it will be no better than my imagination. It'll be exactly what what I had sort of imagined in advance. Nice. Um, and and if and if I sit down and look for something that surprises me, what will come out the other side will be something I didn't I, that I wasn't expecting, and is usually much more dimensional and more interesting and and much more reflective of how I happen to feel right now and what and um, you know sort of what's going on subconsciously. Uh, mm. it, in much better music that way. Interesting, because I'm I'm reading a book right now called Songwriters on Songwriting, and it's uh, mm -hmm. interviews with songwriters over the years, some of the greatest. Uh, but what's interesting to me is that there is a philosophy within some of those interviews from the old Tin Pan Alley songwriters, you know, the guys who were writing songs to order, that yeah. is the antithesis of that, that they almost couldn't work like there was a question one of the guys who does the interviews in the book said uh, to them what comes first the melody or the lyrics and the guy said well actually the phone call yeah you know no that like, that's that's and that is 
that's a different type of songwriting, you know. Like that's a craft. I mean, that, that's amazing. And I'm and I'm and I. Those people are, um, you know, so those are the greatest songs written in our country. I think, you know. Um, but that's also from a time when um, when. Uh, it was a, a more industrial business, you know. If you if you want to be a songwriter for uh, for big pop stars, then what you need to do is is churn out you know shit tons of tracks and um, and have one for every flavor and and hope you can sell them. Um, that seems like a, a for me personally that would be a miserable existence. Mm. Um, I I much per, like I like actually making the things as opposed to trying to make a living. <laughs> Sticking, sticking one cog into somebody else's machine, you know. Um, right. Although I, I understand that I'm, I'm, I'm lucky to be in the position of being able to do that, and it's not, um, it, you know, that's that's not exactly the wisest advice. It, I guess it depends on what what people want to do. I also think like you know, making music because you're passionate about it is something different than making, you know, trying to figure out the best, the best. Uh, checkbook in music, you know, those are t- sure. totally different questions. So. Sure. Well, listen, Damien, we could eat up another hour of your time, but I think you've been very generous to hang with us and show us your toys. Let's look at Thank that. Thank you. Wow. That's uh, it's nice. Isn't it? It's pretty good. I, so have you been working on this the whole interview? No, this is just the one that happens to be. I mean, there's also there's there's another little circle off the side of it hanging out right uh, now, too. I see. There, um, I had a really, I had, I had, yeah, I've, well, I, I, I won't go to the whole history of these things, but they spent a lot of time on my kitchen table. All right. Well, if they if they factor into a upcoming video, we can say we saw it here first. Yep. You saw it here first. The genesis of the yet to be made magnet magnetic video. video. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> awesome. Okay, well, everyone. Thank you listen, for your questions and your time. Yeah. Thank you so much. And uh, everybody, uh, you know, get out there and. Uh, Give your continued support to OK Go. I don't, you really don't need my plug, do you? I'm not. I'm not about well, to I, sort of. Maybe. I, I, I am a tastemaker, you know. You are a tastemaker, and I would imagine. I'm guessing that people watching this right now are actually all all um, pretty awesome musicians. I, I I suspect the people who are who are deeply involved with the, the production forums are the people I would actually want on my side in the first place. So, uh, hi guys. Yeah, we got I, we got a great community. And they've been a, a lot of regulars that have been coming for all these events and music making months. So I'm getting to know them all by their handles very well. So, well, awesome. Awesome. Damien, nice thanks to meet so much. Bye bye. And uh, we will see you later. See you. So, that does it for us. Uh, tune in tomorrow. We have another event that was a late addition to our schedule tomorrow. We're going to be talking with uh, two guys from Nimbit. Nimbit's a music marketing website. And they're sort of a, um, I guess in a way, they're a one-stop shopping kind of operation. So they do uh, direct sales. They do um, uh, email mailings. They track metrics at your shows. And they can sort of help you target regions that you're doing well to tour. And so it's it's a whole thing. they got a whole platform. And they're going to tell you all about it. It's pretty cool. So just check that out tomorrow. It's going to be on tomorrow, same time as this one. So whatever time you tuned in for this one, same time tomorrow, 9 p.m. Europe, 3 p.m. Eastern, noon on the West Coast. And as always, don't forget, send me your songs. You can tweet them uh, with the hashtag uh, hash MMM prop songs, or you can post them on our Facebook wall. Um, or I've, I've started getting them other ways, too. If you're members of our user form, I've gotten some private messages there with them. That works, too. I'll get them however you want to send them, and I'll listen to them however you send them to me because I'm really enjoying them, and I want to get your stuff out there. So that's it for tonight. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for your questions, and we will see you tomorrow.